Good afternoon and welcome to the KLSU Tailgate Show. I'm Matt Houston alongside Nick Hallaby and Will Eunice. It was a good week for the Tigers last go around. They knocked off BYU 27-0. Ed Orgeron says we only saw 27%, excuse me, 10% of that LSU offense. Uh, the Tiger defense looked really good too. They had a lot of young guys. Before we get into Danny Etling, the youth on the defensive side, BYU, we need to talk a little bit about uh, last week's game as a whole. And I guess the first question I'll ask, Nick, I'll start with you. Was last week BYU being bad or LSU being good? It was LSU being good. BYU is not the best team, but it's not like they underperformed. They're a physical team. You know what they're going to bring on defense. But this was BYU going up against a system they hadn't seen before, that nobody would seen before. And LSU executed it very, very well. Will. I mean, uh, you look at the performance by the Tigers, just in general, it was complete. And I think the only place, if you could find anything that was lacking, was when you get toward the red zone. Yeah. And we'll talk about that a little bit later with the offense. Yep. So let's get into the offense. Um, Danny Etling looked really good, and I think that's where we should start. He is the quarterback. Um, Nick, I know you were, you were pro Miles Brennan. Did your impression of Danny Etling change? Do you feel any different, and, and how do you think he did? I think Danny was a little more consistent. He showed some very nice arm strength on those two large uh, passes, mm -hmm. the one to Chark and the one to Gage. It, it, it wasn't necessarily my impression on Etling. It's more what the system can do and if Miles Brennan can do better in the, in the system. The few passes that we saw, and, and it was very consistent, and it was very, uh, um, very well executed, but the few pass plays we saw, those receivers were in, were in space. Yeah. And so kind of where I'm coming from is if you can do that for Danny Etling and your excuse for not bringing in Brendan is maybe he can't handle the pressure, why not bring Brendan in if there's no pressure? But, yeah, I, I, I like what I saw from Danny. In short. I thought Danny Etling was very efficient. Um, yeah. uh, and that goes for the whole quarterback system. And uh, even though Miles Brennan only threw one pass. But the receivers <laughs> were open. And when the receivers were open and they were targeted – they didn't drop passes. I don't think a wide receiver had a drop no. against BYU. We know that's plagued LSU receivers throughout time. And then looking at that as well, 57 run plays by that offense shows exactly what we were talking about last week, that this offense will still be a run-first offense. Yeah, I'm glad you brought the drops up because that's something I hadn't thought about. Um, all the way back to Brandon LaFell. I mean, it seems like there are talented guys every year on this roster that just don't catch. I mean, you had Malachi Dupree last year who struggled with drops, and in my opinion shouldn't have gone to the NFL draft. He needed to develop another year. I mean, you, you, you can go back and you can trace that line. The only time I don't remember guys dropping the football was, you know, 2012 with, with Landry and Beckham, and you don't expect them to make drops too. Yeah, I know. When you have those two guys, you're, you're pretty well set in the receiving core. Yeah, and I guess the the point that needs to be made here is, is generally you have speed receivers and you have possession receivers and a deep threat. And it seems like our speed receivers are also possession receivers, but I don't know if we have a deep threat yet. Yeah, I'm not sure. You'd think it'd be DJ, DJ Chark just right. because that's what Etling's used to. We saw flashes of it last year. Even in the game against BYU, we, we saw the one deep play, maybe even Russell Gage. But, no, I'm not sure yet either. Um, but we're not necessarily sure that's what Matt Canada's system is going to call point. for. Because it, it, you saw a lot of intermediate plays. You saw a lot of little uh, kind of button hooks to tight ends or little corner routes out to, to your wideouts. Maybe they don't need a deep threat, but no, I'm not sure either. I'm not sure yet who's the deep threat. I think the deep ball is very important in the college game because I think you see a lot more deep plays in the college game, of course, than in the NFL. Yeah. But um, So I think having a deep threat like DJ Chart is very important. I think where this receiver core will be looking is past Russell Gage, mm -hmm. who's the third guy. Russell Gage put up an excellent performance, in my opinion, only though he had a couple receptions. He made them count. And they were on, I think one was on a third and long play. Yeah. And um, and it kind of set up a scoring drive for LSU. I think it's that third guy. Will it be Drake Davis? Will it be Steven Sullivan? We, Will it be, uh, as you said last week, Jacoby Stevens making a late run in? We'll never know. Even Derek Dillon had a couple of receptions yeah. last week for, a couple, for like around 20 yards. So it, you don't really know. And we didn't see a lot of the passing either. I mean, DJ Chark True. was the leading receiver with only four receptions. So yeah. it, it's... 
there's a, there's a lot we haven't seen yet. But they spread the ball around, they which did. is something that they haven't done in the past, and I think that's what's really exciting. And another thing, I guess the, the biggest difference, and we'll get into this in a second more on Canada's offense, but last season... Uh, under Orgeron, when they flipped the offense up, it seemed like it was ground, pound, ground, pound, and then deep shot. And it worked. And LSU was busting off a lot of deep plays. That wasn't the case Saturday night. It was a lot of dink and dunk routes. They had two pretty nice deep balls that they completed, but for the most part, it was six, seven yards at a time. It was consistent. It was. And, uh, you know, I really appreciate the offense. I got to watch the game from the press box in, in the Superdome. And looking at it from the press box, they spread the field so well Yeah. that, like, so many of the little dink routes to the outside, maybe a little in the flat to Edwards Hilaire. Yeah. Or, um, but, yeah, they spread the field out very well, and it, and it left the defense guessing, at least until they got to the red zone. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it was a lot of dink dunk plays, not a lot of things down deep. And I think later in the season last year, it was around when Edwards on took over and they flipped that offense, the run was getting stopped. Mm-hmm. So they'd have to go to that deep threat. BYU couldn't stop the run. I think once Matt Canada saw, oh, we can risk run on these guys all day, no problem. I mean, Jarrell Williams almost went for 98 yards. I mean, almost <laughs> went for 100 yards, right? Yeah. So I, I think why we didn't see a lot of that was because it wasn't necessary and it wasn't needed. Mm-hmm. But they did kind of want to expand that offense and show off a little of what they could do. And I was impressed because with me, a problem in the past been the consistency in the mid-range game. Mm-hmm. It, it's not necessarily can you throw it deep because they've always been able to hit a, the occasional deep play. Yeah. Can you throw a 15-yard out? Can you do it without hitting receivers in the back of the head? Can you yeah. throw across the field without an interception? Can, can you complete a third and long? And they show that they have the ability to do that. And those out routes looked pretty good. I mean, they were throwing to the side. They owned the sideline last night. That was the only critique I could give for Danny Etling is there were a few of those passes. And, look, he played great. I don't want to detract from that. There were a few of those passes I would like to see a little more arm behind because when you play teams with faster secondary members, that, that's a ball that you can't float up. But I am super impressed. Um, quite frankly, it's what I expected. The I guess we have to look at this offense as a whole now because we see the consistency. And one of the things Ed Orgeron pointed out in his press conference on Monday is that BYU was playing two high safeties. They wanted to get bludgeoned to death. And I think for the first time in a long time, we saw an LSU offensive coordinator take advantage of a defensive scheme, and BYU just didn't adjust. They kind of gave up. Yeah, um, again, as uh, me and Matt, we were talking before the show about under the Miles regime, you would see a defense kind of asking for it. Yeah. And then he wouldn't take advantage of it. He wouldn't use a scheme. He would kind of just manage a game out until the end. Uh, we have the victory. Let's manage the game out to the end. And sometimes that was to his detriment. And I think we're seeing a, a different scheme in a Matt Canada offense that is not afraid to yeah. exploit the defense. Yeah, and I think that could play to the possible diversity of this offense. I mean, they can bludgeon the ball up and down the middle. No problem. You have Darius guys. You have some big bodies up front that can create some space. But if they're stacking the box, the box and just asking you to get burned deep or burned down the sideline, maybe the scheme allows for that. Maybe... maybe there's so many different plays, different styles of motions. You can take advantage of whatever the defense gives you. Maybe it was just that Miles' Miles's offenses were just so one-sided that he was just so stubborn. And partly he was stubborn. Let, let, let's face it. Yeah. Les Miles was a very stubborn when it came to his offensive play calling. You hope, and again, small sample size, but you hope that's not. You hope that this is better. I have never seen a team play LSU and beg them to run the football. That just seems so dumb to me. And I guess I'll answer my own question, the first one I asked you guys. BYU just didn't play well, and I'm not impressed with that coaching. I mean, I I see that they're trying to do some new things there, but, man, I just – who begs a team with Darius Geis to run? A team that can only stop the run. This is BYU's identity. I mean, they were getting burned down the field by Portland State. Portland State wasn't executing the passes because it's Portland State, but – they were they, they don't have a pass defense. Mm-hmm. So they were begging to, to get run over because that's all of anything they had a shot to stop. And there were times where they'd stop Darius guys at the line of scrimmage or Dwell Williams would only pick up three yards or something like that, which was a metaphorical win for that defense, yeah. right? But that's all BYU can do. They don't have the talent level. They they get their winning on defense off of their physicality. Mm-hmm. And so they just thought if they, if they had a shot, let's just try to physical up with LSU. 
and then on the other side of the ball that uh, their offense couldn't keep up. Yeah. Like, that to be fair, it was it's it wasn't a sixty three to zero blowout. It no, twenty seven no. to zero. And I get it's also a new offense for the LSU Tigers, but the offense for BYU was seemingly inept. And they yeah. just, just couldn't do anything. And, and we'll get to that in a second, but part of the reason it was a low-scoring game is because LSU ran the football and had the ball the entire game. I mean, that, I think that could have been a 40-point game, but boy, just talking about this, I'm excited because restraint is sexy. And Matt Canada <laughs> is out here, modest is the hottest offense, and he didn't need to take those deep shots that we've seen in the past, and he just kept running the football. And it was one of those, and you know, we'll, we'll get to A&M in a second too, but A&M wanted to throw the ball around with a 30-point lead, and we saw yeah. what happened to them. And so this was, I was pleased with that play calling and the scheme that they had. So let's get into uh, Canada's offense a little bit deeper. What would you guys think of the motion? We'll start with you. Well, I did a I did a package uh-huh. for Tiger TV on the on the offense and on the motion. And from the first play from scrimmage, when we saw four out of the five offensive linemen switch sides of the line, <laughs> I yeah. and the, all the crowd kind of erupted. It was kind of a oh wait, this isn't the offense we're used to seeing. Yeah, let me let me stop you there. That was such a gimmick. <laughs> no, yeah, absolutely, so hard. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. it was. Uh, there was a lot of complaining in Game of Thrones this year. Of fan service. That was complete <laughs> LSU fan service. I think in the yes. Superdome. I don't know if you can tell from the press box, but I was sitting low. And the second those linemen got up and shifted, the entire Superdome erupted in joy. It was yes. like, see, I think they got more excited for that than they did for yeah. DJ Hart's well, uh, 35-yard that, that catch. That speaks to Les Miles' stubbornness. He wasn't yeah. willing to change. So that little, even if it's just linemen switching positions on the line, that change, the LSU fans were like, this guy's trying something new. This right, and, and, something and new. That, that plays to Matt Canada in a, bit, in, in a bigger picture. Ed Orgeron having to sell this program this year. That's yes. their job. They're not getting fired this year. They have to sell everybody on this offense and on this program. And we didn't see a lot of this offense. Like you said, restraint. It's not just restraint and we don't want to run the score up. We don't want to show Mississippi State uh-huh. and Florida and Auburn our entire playbook yet because we don't have to. Yeah. Um, and that that's what a lot of this was too. But a lot of the shifting, a lot of, especially that opening play, they, they're just trying to sell us on mm-hmm. this is a new LSU offense. And the only thing that bothers me about that is I, I agree with you. I, I laughed because I think everyone knew what was going on. Um, there, the only concern I had is there was about midway through the game or toward maybe in the fourth quarter, and they went for it on fourth and goal because the crowd was a little loud. Yeah, they didn't need to go for it. They should have taken the points. That was the only thing is if you're going to do fan service, you got to do it right, and you can't risk losing points because of it. Pre-snap motion is okay, but I hope that that staff and Ed Orgeron especially know better. Yeah, I, th- I think so, too. Um, that, there's definitely going to be a little bit of a learning curve with that because this yeah. is Ed Orgeron's – yeah, he was head coach at Ole Miss, but this is his Really his first shot. This yeah. is his first big shot as an actual coach and not interim. So he's trying to give the people what they want. He has the entire state of Louisiana in the palm of his hand. <laughs> um, and, yeah. and so he there is a little bit of room for error. And it's his first year. He's not getting fired, right? So some of those things that maybe if Les Miles had done, we'd be killing him for. Ed Orgeron's going to have the space to learn a little bit and be able to pull that off. To talk more about what you had really originally asked me about the pre-play motion. Yeah. It's in the installation of this new position. Uh, some people call it the halfback. Some people call it the F-back. And it's this position that they moved J.D. Moore and David Ducree into mm-hmm. as kind of tight end fullback hybrids. Well, they'll line up in the slot pre-play go across and then line up in a wing back position to block for a left sided run or they'll just switch side of the line they'll switch from the backfield yeah. out into the flat there's tons of movement either the, a wide receiver will fake a sweep or a wing back slash half back slash f back will move on every play yeah that's a pretty much a given in this yeah. offense it's all about misdirection but i don't think that's what hurt byu i think lsu offensive line played pretty well yeah, especially for such a young group, an unproven group. That was one of our major questions heading in. And it still is because this isn't even the most talented BYU team of no. the last five years, right? But they, they got some pretty good push off the ball. A couple times BYU broke through on that fourth on that fourth and two. What frustrated me, they should have picked a different play. Mm-hmm. But <laughs> uh, it, it was it, BYU broke through. But for the, most, for the most part, with a mostly patched together offensive line, at least compared to what we're used to, they did a good job. Mm-hmm. I, I think it was a good warm-up. And, Will, I'll ask you this. 
Do you think that's just the offensive line being better than we expected, or do you think that's part of the scheme and adding additional blockers? Or both. <laughs> I think adding additional blockers was a big key to it. I think we need to be careful as well. Sure. Because this was a BYU team that, honestly, as you just said, wasn't great. Depleted at best. Depleted yes. at best. So I would love to see this offensive line dominate once again against Chattanooga and then be prepared for that test against Mississippi State. That's when the rubber will meet the road for this offensive line, especially the young cats on it, like Sadiq Charles. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so, again, I'm going to – I'm excited. I'm going to be a little cautious, though, on that one. Good. Yeah. Again, <laughs> restraint is sexy. That's got to be the motto from here on out. <laughs> that's the theme of the show. All right, let's go to the other side of the football because that's where the real domination took place. LSU holds them to uh, negative five yards of rushing, under 100 total yards, correct? Yeah. Okay, that was a bludgeoning from a defense that started a ton of freshmen and true freshmen guys that had never played again. We saw people get picks in their first college game ever. We saw lots of good ball pressure. We saw an inability to run the football. What are your impressions, Nick? They're great. They're speed. <laughs> I mean, I think more than anything that stood out to me, and I don't. it was hard to compare it to other years, but I don't remember an LSU defense being this fast. Mm -hmm. Like, they're killing it up and down the field the front the freshman grant the del pet mm -hmm. first couple of plays up at the line of scrimmage a safety making tackles i mean this team is so fast on the defensive side of the ball and, and i mean david randa said it um i don't know if you went back and listened to the broadcast but they were talking about their pregame interviews with randa and the difference in terms of personnel at lsu than his personnel at other places like wisconsin he goes i can have six or seven players on my defense that runs a sub four five mm-hmm that's amazing, <laughs> including, including some defensive linemen. Including every some once defensive in a while. linemen, like that is insane. Just it, it, they're bigger and they're stronger, but we're used to that. The speed, and I think the speed is what's going to define this defense. Yeah, it was impressive. Well, I was uh, I was interviewing Darius Guy's post game, and he was asked about this freshman class and the guys coming in and playing so well in their opening game under the spotlight in the Superdome at the Texas kickoff. At, um, and all he could say was that his class as juniors came in as kids. Mm -hmm. And he said that this class is coming in as men. Yeah. And they're, like, so mature. And he was just emphasizing, like, these guys are ready to play at this level right now. You think that's coaching? Or do you think that's just a different recruiting style? Or, or what do you think? I mean, is it preparation? It can be both. Because the one thing you can't really knock Les Miles and past defensive coordinators for is their defensive recruiter, recruiting. Because yeah. we've had some stars. Um, a few. <laughs> but yeah, in terms of scheming, maybe it's Dave Aranda's amazing scheme. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's the circumstance. I mean, maybe that these defensive players are just that much more talented or else you got lucky. Um, and we've never really seen – we wouldn't have this reaction today if 10 players on defense didn't get suspended or something like that, right? So I, I think it's circumstance. Those players and players – and changing his defensive scheme to their strength. Yeah. This says a little bit about the high school game as well, mm -hmm. is that these coaches are kind yeah. of molding these guys to play at that level now, especially at places like IMG Academy, yeah. American Heritage, the, the places around Houston, Texas, where we grab these recruits from, even uh, where where um, where Stevens was from in Tennessee. I, um, I can't pronounce that town name. <laughs> um, but Don't these, try. I think they're uh, – I think they're really preparing these kids well for college, especially IMG Academy. You just see them pumping out. We're talking Drake Davis, Grant yeah. Delpit, all these guys. They're coming straight out of IMG Academy ready to play, and they perform. Here's the scary thing if I'm an LSU opponent. This was a half-strong defense yep. at half strength. Yep, without your best player in Arden No Key. Arden Key. They got, they got pressure. They got sacks without Arden Key from the outside. Almost no outside pressure. Kevin Tolliver didn't play. No correct? Kevin Tolliver. Um, Lots of other guys. Yeah, yeah. It, this is a defense at half strength that dominated a team that really isn't a slouch. This wasn't an FCS team. No. Even though this was BYU at not full BYU strength, it was formidable. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, it, that's the speed on this defensive team is what got to me. I think you have to give some credit, and you guys have, to Ed Orgeron and the spirit of competition that he's brought to this football team. You've got, uh, you know, your competition day during practice, and then we heard Dave Aranda talk about Matt Canada's offense beating their defense consistently throughout spring training, and he was upset, and he was frustrated, and I think when you, when you push your guys, especially young guys, when you push them, they have to grow up early, Yeah. and I think 
especially this game. And now we'll transition to UT Chattanooga. This next game, these are excellent opportunities for them to kind of flex, build their confidence. So what kind of advantage does LSU have, Nick, playing two tune-up games before they go into the SEC? I, they have – it's like a, a minor game slash practice almost. It, it's tune-up in the sense that you get to go hit somebody else, yeah. which is always fun. And you – kind of get to see what you actually do on a football field in a non-controlled environment. Um, and kind of to speak to that, I think that what's going to define these this Ed Orgeron team is competition. I mean, we talked about it in terms of the quarterback competition, but everybody on this team has to compete for their spot. Matt Canada and Dave Aranda's offense and defense are competing against each other every day to the point where Dave Aranda's getting frustrated that he's losing. Uh, I think competition is what drives the best product on a football field that's what's going to define this team, and that's the advantage of playing against BYU and Chattanooga mm-hmm. because you compete for spots and compete for performance. I can only agree with that. I think competition <laughs> raises the best out of people. And you had these young kids coming in, Caleb on, Caleb on Chase on. You've got Pretty Jacob Williams, Phillips, yeah. Patrick Queen, Tyler Taylor, Tyler Taylor all, Ray Thornton. All these guys are linebackers, and they're competing for spots. By the way, all those guys played their first game for LSU against BYU and and played well on that defense, they're competing for spots, and they want that spot because they know that a spot in the linebacking court at LSU might get you to the NFL. Yeah. Look at look at the, a look spot, at the record. Any spot on a defense at LSU, whether it be the linebacking court, the secondary, or up front, yep. gets, you, gets you an NFL at least opportunity. Yeah, and that's one thing. That's one criticism that I think is fair of Les Miles is he was very loyal to the guys that he selected in the preseason. He was going to ride with them until the end. And there's something commendable about that, but it's not always the best strategy to win football games. And now I'm not sure that these guys that the freshmen replaced that were suspended or hurt, boy, they might have to fight for their job. I mean, we could see some of these freshmen like Shaysan, like Tyler Taylor, like Greedy Williams, they may be starters for the rest of the year now. Here's where I get excited. What if it's a defensive system where it's split time, mm-hmm. and where and you're, you're fresh, and you're fresh the entire game? You yeah, have people say crazy. it's just where your third and fourth stringers are out there making plays fresh. I mean that that in itself is exciting. Yeah, that's um, extremely scary for all offense. Oh, I mean, yeah, because when those players are out on the field, they're out there to make a and prove a point. And how, you don't want this defense trying to prove a point against you. How scared is everyone of Alabama's defensive front? Every year, because Terrifying. you know that they're bringing off yeah. a set of guys and putting on a set of guys yeah. almost just as good. Five star exactly. exits and a better five star enter. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. So that would be a fantastic advantage. Um, we're going to spend just a little bit on UT Chattanooga. They're an FCS program. They're consistently in the top 25 in the FCS. Last year, they lost in the second round to Sam Houston. Um, new coach, new staff. There's not a lot of info on them. So, again, this is kind of uh, – it's just a chance for LSU to flex, and your boy Miles Brennan might get some playtime. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I got excited when he was brought in against BYU, and, and to, the, to the extent where I was irrationally excited. Where, like, yeah. You know, it was a handoff. No, it was handoffs. Like, oh, he hit, handed it off like a champ, <laughs> right? <laughs> well, on that lateral, my, mm. tight spiral on the mm. two-yard lateral. But, um, I mean, yeah, I think he could get some, point, uh, get, get, get some playing time, especially late third, early fourth if they just blow the doors off of Chattanooga like they should. I watched a little bit of Chattanooga film. They had their opener against Jacksonville State. I mean, they weren't completing passes or getting the passes off against Jacksonville State. It's going to be ugly tomorrow. Yeah, I agree. Will, uh, this is a little bit of the stats from from the Chattanooga game. Um, they threw t- two interceptions. Um yeah, they threw only for 218 passing yards. The whole offense had 294 yards against Jacksonville State. Mm-hmm. And that's a not a great defensive. Hey, team. that's more than BYU had against LSU. Yeah. <laughs> that's true. It's 200. It's 200 and what 99. Yeah, uh, more more than their rush yards. Yeah. They had. <laughs> well, we know that they've got a I think an All FCS uh, offensive lineman. Their quarterback, Alejandro Benefield, is supposed to be a guy that that program, Tom Arth, can build around. Um, that's all I want to talk about, you, you know, UTC. I mean, we just don't know enough. I, I'm looking for this LSU defense, because I, I just love talking about them, to pitch another shutout. Yeah, that, that's – They should. They're yeah. going to try to go to Starkville with a clean sheet. Mm-hmm. And that's, I mean, <laughs> that's and intimidating. Here's what's important. Last year in LSU's tune-up games, they didn't look good. 
They were sloppy two years ago against Syracuse. They played poorly against Eastern Michigan. Until Ed Orgeron took over, that team looked bad doing little things against bad yeah. football teams. Can I say the one thing that slightly worries me that I'm not happy with? Yeah. Special teams. Okay. I think that on the kickoffs, especially in the first half, the coverage wasn't the best. I think they were giving up 10 to 15 yards more than they should have on kickoffs. Yeah. You have a mixed, you have a missed field goal. Got to clean it up a little bit on special teams. Are you concerned about Gonsolin? Or you think it's just first game jitters? It could be just first game jitters. Uh, you got to make it though. You got to make that field goal. Yeah. It, was <laughs> easy. It's, uh, it was an easy shot, but that's one thing. Special teams used to be a trademark, right? Mm-hmm. Worries me a little bit. Yeah, I'm with you, and I'm just glad that we've got guys who can kick the ball into the end zone or at least told to kick the ball into the end zone this year. I, yeah. I'm, I'm just looking for it. Again, this is an opportunity for LSU to get better. This is a glorified – I don't want to call it a practice, but it's an opportunity for them to tune in on things that they're not going to have the chance to do against Alabama, Mississippi State, any of the SEC schools that they play. And so – this is a good chance for them. I'm with you on special teams because they've been bad in the past five or six years under Pivato, and so this is a new it's a new start for them. Yeah, um, I'm looking for th- this is a chance for the coaches for LSU, I believe. Yeah, because this is not a practice where the other coach knows your playbook in and out. Mm-hmm. Now, I don't know how much studying the uh, Chattanooga offense and defensive coordinators have done, but they're not going to know as much as the coach on the other side of the practice field will. Yep. Yeah. You'll have people scheming against you in different ways than Aranda has schemed for you in practice. Yeah. And it's a way for you to test your offense against different schemes. All right. We got to get into picks real quick because we only have about two and a half minutes left. Uh, last week, Nick 4-0. I was 3-1. and Will Eunice texted me midway through the Texas A&M game and told me he was going to be 2-2 two and two and two because A&M was up by 30. Um, he forgot A&M was A&M. So you're at 1-3, and three, Will. Um, we're going to pick TCU and Arkansas first. Just give me a score times low. Uh, I'm picking Arkansas with the upset. Okay. Don't have too much faith in that TCU defense. I think Arkansas looked pretty impressive the first couple of weeks. They can run the ball. They have a pretty good passing game. Look for Arkansas uh, 35-28. to 28. Okay. TCU defeated uh, Jackson State 63 to nothing last week. I'm not putting too much weight onto that game. I believe the Big 12 is a conference on the downhill. Um, <laughs> yeah. and if they don't is change something soon, <laughs> it'll, be, it'll be just formed soon. Arkansas will take the victory. I'm going to go 35-27. Uh, to 27. All right, you guys are both going with Arkansas. I'm going to go with TCU. I don't think you should sleep on Gary Patterson there. Um, I don't I don't know about the score. I think TCU I, – I don't know. I mean, I don't know about TCU's offense. Kenny Trill and company. I just – 28-21 TCU. Uh, Nebraska and Oregon. Oregon put up 77 last week against an FCS opponent. The most they scored on an open day. Nick. Uh, Oregon. I, I, it's just I don't know much about Nebraska's defense. I don't, I don't have faith in it. They, they okay. don't stay healthy, and they're not very disciplined. And I think an Oregon offense is deadly. And their defense improved a little bit this year. Okay. They are, they're not the Oregon of three years ago. But I'll take Oregon over Nebraska. It's hard to pick against Nick after last week. I'm going Oregon as well. <laughs> so uh, I'm not going to predict the score. I have I've really haven't done enough research See, on that okay. yet. You guys' problem last week was too much faith in the SEC. You're right. You right. had to look past right. the conference bias. All right, so real quick, um, no description. we got 30 seconds. SEC matchup, SEC, ACC, Auburn, Clemson, Nick. Clemson. Clemson. Okay. Clemson. Uh, OU, Ohio State. OU. Ohio State. Okay, I'm going OU. Uh, and finally, Georgia, Notre Dame. Georgia. Notre Dame is forever mediocre. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I thought you were about to pick them. Georgia, why is Notre Dame in the top 25? All right, finally, give me a score. we got about 10 seconds left. LSU, BYU. Wait, LSU, Chattanooga? Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, LSU, 42, Chattanooga, 0. 35 uh, nothing. 42-0. All right, guys, that's been the KLSU Tailgate Show. Thanks for tuning in. We'll be back here this time next week. For Nick Halby and Will Eunice, I'm Matt Houston. Go Tigers.